We can start on time and lecture start 15 minutes after the appointed hour so everybody gets a good fuck. But over here, it works the other way around. <laughs> Meetings start 15 minutes late and lectures start right on time so we get our full hour and a half. Um, I'm happy to welcome you all to, I think, our third stage our event for the spring and um, to introduce our presenter and our commentator from in this building. Um, uh, so we, we decided to not make it too stressful for me. Laura Hansen comes uh, from uh, Hopkins via a year at a year that's current in Germany at um, uh, the International Consortium for Research and Humanities at Erlangen, um, part of the investigation. Um, and she and I share a history, um, well, I was a little earlier, I think, um, of going to Penn. Um, not, I did actually. Charles Rosenberg was my advisor for about, well, at least was on my committee, um, and uh, took at least three questions. Um, I someday I'll tell you jokes about Charles Rosenberg. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have your own, sure. Marty has very widely published in, in the history of uh, science in, in Qing Manchu uh, in modern, early modern China. Um, and an author of a major book um, uh, out from Rutledge last year, speaking of epidemics in Chinese medicine, uh, disease, and the geographic imagination in late imperial China. Um, and so online is a, um, a, a, a member of the Department of Public Health um, and the graduate program in environmental sciences here at OSU, um, working PhD in 2003. Um, has positions of note in China at the um, College of Public Health World Sensing Geographic Information Systems, Beijing Normal University, and Sichuan Center for Disease Control and Prevention at Chengdu, and has a huge record of publication um, in waterborne diseases and epidemics in public health in China, specifically among others, malaria, hemorrhagic fever. And the most recent work is taking him out of China and into the Sahel uh, off the chat. So um, he will set the stage um, after Marta has given us a presentation. He'll set up some tensions between history and public health and, and uh, set up some questions for us to consider. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and have so many um, I'm, I'm assuming that you uh, uh, at least looked at the um, pre-circulated paper. I'm afraid that some of you might not have actually received the images that went with them. Um, so I am going to go through the, the images um, and give a preliminary uh, summary of what I'm arguing and how they relate to the images, um, both to just put it all in a general terms about what I'm working on here and how I think of it as fitting into a, a, another book project and how, where I see things that are missing and, and, and what I think of as chapters in the paper that I already received. Um, I should say that this um, project started out as a basically digging out um, my footnotes in the last end of my seventh and eighth chapter of my book. Um, one of the maps, the one on the right here, actually got into my book. It's the earliest um, top-down view of, of uh, it's the earliest disease map I found of China from the top-down, placing it, uh, the history of cholera and the world context and linking it to East Asia in 1878. So this got actually bigger in my book, and then I realized there are lots of other maps from the same source of the medical reports of the Imperial Maritime Customs Bureau, and um, from then on I found many more maps. So I found it was a really interesting way to talk about my book without actually going over the arguments in my book. And um, the, the title has changed, which kind of gives you some um, indication of uh, what I was originally thinking. Because originally it was from imagining to visualizing the geography of disease. Because I thought of the earlier map on the left side, which comes from a um, uh, late 15th century edition of a Southern Song um, Encyclopedia. And I thought of that as the imagining of a geographic space. And then the later one with this uh, tracking of cholera and then the distribution of other diseases is more uh, a new form of visualizing natural diseases, right? So uh, thinking of one as imagination. But now I think of them both as a way of visualizing geographic space. 
Um, and I think I left out the imagining because I think actually this is another form of imagination too, just with different kinds of um, uh, standards or ways of um, presenting knowledge and different types of infrastructure actually. Um, so the first image really is what my first book is about. And the second one um, may be what I end up writing the second book about, even though I'm here working on a totally different project, <laughs> uh, um, which I think will probably consume the rest of my scholarly career. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of think of this project as maybe the gift my first book is giving to me for you know taking so long to finish. <laughs> And, and it's not only will be eight years, maybe a full century, rather than a couple of millennia, which is what I had to cover in writing the biography of a disease concept. So it's calm the camp now. And what I'm going to present to you that's not in the paper is how I, I think of it's the book, if it becomes a book, and its structure and how it relates to this paper. Because I think that you as the collective intelligence in this room probably have some insights in what would work and what would not work, and you know, maybe even directions to take that I certainly haven't thought of yet. So, um, with that introduction, I'm going to give you this outline slide. Um, so, you know, it's a, stru I, 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 it's a structure of the, of the way I organize the slides. I actually organize, I use these PowerPoints not just for presentations, but I use them to organize my thoughts and, and I give you know, sources in there and things like that because it helps me work out arguments. Uh, but here, um, what I wanted to say is that in terms of the structure of a book, I'm committed to including the Chinese geographic imagination and then the celestial imagination that comes up in these, in these early ways of, of visualizing the geographic asymmetries. Um, in, in early modern China. So that would be chapter one. And the second chapter that's not at all in the paper to refer to would be, and actually I would not use this as a chapter, European map and precedence, precedence I'd probably just refer to Thomas Pope's book and not go over them like I did in this paper, but I felt I had to do that for a non-history of medicine audience. Um, so then what I'm thinking of next, before you get to the first examples in China of mapping diseases of China from the, from the medical reports, published in the, um, by the Maritime Customs Bureau, is a chapter on um, administrative statistics. And this would be relying on secondary scholarship of my colleague, Andre Bayard, who is, has a nice manuscript on um, the development of statistics in China, and a really nice work on, on the kind of numbers that were important to the Chinese administration. And in addition, I'll bring in work of Chinese um, historians, historians of Chinese demography, so what were the kind of rudimentary mortality statistics that were being collected where. And in addition, I would include medical institutions um, from the long like, 19th century where there was some uh, gathering of medical cases. So I think that's a uh, really necessary part to look at, to provide a more symmetric approach to um, what was happening in China before you have the more systematic gathering of medical um, related by statistics um, under the British Empire and the medical training medical officers from Europe to come in and make these later maps possible. So that's missing entirely from the manuscript, but I'm working on it to present something in Tel Aviv in um, Then the second chapter would be, these, this to me works together, the Imperial Mar Maritime Customs Bureau's material, and then ending it with this uh, major publication on the disease of China in um, Formosa and Korea in 1910 that I introduced, and I think that they relate well together because the, these uh, Jeffries and Maxwell who published this book are, are very much coming out of the same medical community that was publishing the medical reports, and they rely on them, and they talk about using them for their, um, the stats that they use to produce these maps, uh, and there are about there are nine of them, and it's just a very interesting um, synthesis at the moment, and I have a lot to unpack in terms of where they the information, and, and what diseases at that time are understood in the laboratory model and which ones they don't quite understand and they're still working on a more geographic, um, local, miasma kind of model, like very, very easy mm -hmm. And I allude to those things, but I think these two work together as done at the beginning and ending chapter. And the next one would be with the end of, um, I see that uh, both the Manchuria and Plague epidemic, which is a major moment in history, has been very well studied. And one of the nice things about a project like this is that 
I don't have to be, you know, down the rabbit hole of classical Chinese. <laughs> this is most of it's in English, or if it's in Chinese, it's modern Chinese. That's really easy to read in comparison <laughs> for me. Um, so that's kind of a, again a gift from my first book, I think, <laughs> which was, I, was entirely classical Chinese, um, pretty much. And then, then I think ending with um, when he ends um, the, and the northern. When he moves out of the Northern Manchuria Plague Prevention Service and then takes up uh, the National Quarantine Service in Shanghai, yeah, which I have not mentioned at all here. There's many more maps, and it's involved in tropical medicine um, and global circulation of these uh, you know, tropical medicine um, researchers and scientists and these publishing proceedings. And it's a whole different ball of wax, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so that's I see right here basically four chapters that I'm thinking about, and I've kind of got ideas about the, the three of them and working on that, that kind of administrative stats, biostatistics. Um, and, I, and I would like to just end it with the 1950s, uh, not doing any PRC stuff, and God forbid, that would really open up the <laughs> because it would be complicated. There's a lot of interesting maps that come out of that period, and public health posters, etc. But what's interesting about the 1950s, you have the Germans atlas of diseases in the world, and China figures in it very, in very interesting ways. And I think it would be a nice conclusion for it. Um, and I should say, before the 1950s, you start in the 1940s to have Chinese scientists publishing disease maps in Chinese publications for, for other Chinese scientists. And I think that's, a, that's a, um, a nice way to follow up on the public health posters from 1921 that were written for you know, um, in connect with Chinese for ordinary Chinese, and then to look at the maps, the top of the maps that are written in Chinese for other Chinese trained, you know, I mean, Chinese scientists that is trained in Western medicine. So that's that's sort of the structure of the book. I think uh, six chapters is nice. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Um, so um, I don't want to. I know that we want to have dominantly discussion here. So in the next 15 minutes. Maybe I can do it in 10 minutes. I'm just going to go over without um, fleshing out my arguments in any detail the images. So the first images have to do with the geographic imagination, celestial imagination. And these, these two images um, here, and then this third one, are ones that actually got into my book because they were aware of the only illustrations I found of this northwest southeast axis that figured in the Chinese medical text and were very important in understanding how geography determined different kinds of illnesses and also corporeal types. And I had a talk about that in my friend. Um, what I found very interesting about this map, later, not only recently found in um, Oxford's uh, World Reading Library, are, um, no, I, I, I brought this up too, because that same northwest southeast um, axis is, is, is um, depicted on the hand in the um, 1624 medical book I talked about in, the, in my um, in my paper by John Jay Bean. So I, I think of uh, the uh, my first book, book, book being about what was imagined on the left hand as being the <coughs> northwest and southeast um, kind of major asymmetry in John Crawford, and then what he actually wrote on the hand, the characters up here being what my second book. Well, I don't know if that's going to be the second, but the the handbook as I call it, unpacking what those. Uh, characters mean and how the hand was used as a memory device and calculating device in the of China. Um, so back to this map. So in a, in a, in a Wang Bao Chuan Shu, which is very well known, and many different editions of it. In fact, each edition is important to look at because they're really different um, in terms of what they depict. And here I found um, for the first time, I, uh, which you don't see in the, in the earlier um, encyclopedia, star maps attached. A very clear depiction of heaven as a circle and earth as a square. You still have the southeast waters crashing into up against the northwest mountains there. Um, and I think it's uh, the same classic phrase here that uh, heaven is round, earth is square, that heaven is in the northwest, and the earth is completely in the south. Um, east, I think about and even more schematic, and you can hardly tell that those mountains and waters, but the, the, the constellations are very clear, the 28 million waters are very clearly marked. And here you have the um, North and uh, South Pole. Um, this this map is uh, from another um, another book altogether um, from the late 17th century. And what I found very interesting in this one is we have here clear indication that this represents Ming China, 
which was published in that, in that regime. Um, you have uh, Japan indicated here, Korea, so you know, from that very abstract image of the southeastern oceans, you know, bumping up against the northwestern mountains, you have China emerging that looks more like what we'd expect in, in the history of photography in China. But you have stars still. So it's, it's still a cosmological map. Yeah, the cosmography and photography match together, very hybrid product that I find very interesting. And then even on another level, it's uh, kind of symbolic tropes, you have the eight trigrams, which are very clearly marked according to the traditional northwest, southeast uh, directions you actually use a hand and memorize to I find many um, hand mnemonics with the trigrams presented in just this way, north and south. And then this is just another, just to show you that the earlier image from the Wambao Trench continues on in later editions. It's not that they one supersedes the other. So this is just preliminary. I'm sure that um, my colleague Rukini, who's going to be commenting on this paper in Academia Civica, will find uh, many more examples and other um, almanacs and daily use encyclopedias that are in Taiwan libraries. I'm hoping to find many of them myself um, when I'm there in uh, June. So I'm just, I'm not even going to go through these European examples, just that the traditional medical geography was very strong in the 18th century. Um, Europe, you see here, the position contemplating the disease of the world. And the, the earliest maps relate to, uh, kind of world maps actually relate to tracing the trajectory of cholera. And um, very famous map here, of course, John Snow's. Um, and that, this I used to illustrate the argument that I um, very much took, you know, borrowed from Thomas Post's work on photographies of um, disease. Um, and he makes a very good argument that I used about how the maps were evidence and arguments and used to think through possible possible relationships were, that were not quite understood yet because you know, he really thought there was something in the water and but they couldn't they didn't have the technology to see was what was in the water. But they did have the mapping technology to for him to say it relates to the Rod Street pump, you know, and um, a lot of um, yeah, he didn't, he didn't convince the physicians that that was the case because they can't see what is in the water. Yet, yeah, not until the late um, 18 or early 1880s. And then um, some other maps are trying to figure this in, and the stats that are, are used here are all from the military, European uh, military corps that are spread around um, the world at that time. And, um, so, this is, the, this is the crux of what I'm most interested in here, and um, what I I found to be incredibly rich material um, that I've just taken an initial stab at in my presentation with you. Um, at a time custom service, for example, in the chapter that I have that I would like to address, I have to talk about what kind of new you know, numerical knowledge was presented in these reports. And how does it how did it differ from what was um, there before? And fortunately, Hans Monderven at Cambridge is working on that actually. Um, so I can rely on his work and Andre Bernard's and other people's work. Oh, this is the first map published. Um, I think it's very interesting because at first glance you have no idea it's Yunnan. I mean, Yunnan is not, it's just connecting the dots of where um, plague outbreaks were reported to um, Manson, who submitted this to this map that he wrote um, to the medical reports. Um, so it's very interesting, um, I think, in each case to flesh out who were the informants and how uh, how were these maps produced, what kind of information. Here it's, there's, there's, it's, it's really, I think, very clear that he's relying on a network of foreigners throughout Yunnan and where or even merchants, maybe some Chinese merchants, but both Chinese also reporting, and then connecting the dots. And they're most interested in its you know, directionality and flow to try to understand what, what's, what's transmitted. Different, this is the first map again um, that they put into my book on cholera, and this is the first time situating China in the global um, cholera pandemics. Um, the actual person who published it was based in Japan, was the most interested in Japan, I think that was about. Um, and again, it's about when is the first time in China that's it's China. But this is kind of at the same position, very different orientation. He was researching very, very in Japan, so it's not about the vector or the movement, it's about location, and very, very is thought to have very local causes in that local climate, right? long before the vitamin um, E deficiency. Okay, um, and this is again similar to the other plague map in that it's 
much more detail, but again, charting its transmission. Now, this is a very different kind of map from the 1894 Hong Kong. Um, like I said, it's very well studied because um, Gerson was there and um, uh, Kitazaro as well, who of course discovered the um, Gerson and this Castillo. Castillo at this facility's um, um, independently accepted labs. And, um, what I find interesting about these maps is that they're house, not just house to house um, indications of where plague occurred, but also rat um, uh, cases of plague. So they're still trying to work out the relationship with the rats. And this um, I, I, I do that it's very much influenced by Susan Jones' work on the syllabic plague knowledge, and so much of the uh, early knowledge of syllabic plague actually came out of the context of China. So I think it's very interesting to think of China as a laboratory itself, feels like that knowledge is about these diseases are then brought back to the, the medical and uh, Europe. So this, it, this, these maps obviously uh, depict a very um, strong colonial government and ability to track and control, et cetera. I just uh, put this in here because um, it's, not, it's uh, actually from, borrowed from the idea of Russia as an octopus, is borrowed from British um, satirical cartoons, a critique of uh, Russian expansionism. But it's a, a nice indication of the you know, tentacle of Russia coming in with the Russian railway that then ended up becoming the most very important in the 1910 <coughs> outbreak. Um, and it's uh, later, you see, the, the later maps, the, it's a leprosy map from 1937 that I didn't include that has a, a man somewhat like that, the sick man of Asia, representing leprosy in China. So it's an interesting, different type. Uh, style of math, and I concluded this talk. But this is a major pivotal moment of 1910. Jeffries and Maxwell um, publish a, a whole bunch of maps um, at the very beginning of the Fourth Round Diseases of China, Formosa, and um, Korea. Um, and I think it's very interesting that they divided up China into these also geographical areas. So this um, idea of the geographic origins of um, the disease is still very strong in the 1910 book, and by 1928 it's considered to be obsolescent, which is the, one of the main arguments I make. That this, you know, kind of default to look at uh, geographic determinants is still very much present in the 1910 book, but 18 years later it's considered to be um, not, not uh, as, as relative, as not as important as the lab. Um, so there's a major shift or isolating specific causes for the specific diseases. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this is that uh, seven <laughs> is a very strange form um, because it's basically indicating all the areas that have a lot of global interaction. They're all the, the Treaty Port Shanghai, it's all the Shanghai. Um, and then there's just some examples. Um, the plate map is very interesting here because it not only maps um, plague areas, of course the, the one in, in the north is very important, um, but also where rats, you have rat epidemics. So you see the development of the understanding of sylvatic plague and, and, and understanding of plague reservoirs in these maps as well. And this is just to show you that the, the maps are really quite different. Um, so there are no dates in the plague one, but you see dates in cholera. Whereas, of course, the rats is local, right? it's coming from the Yeah, this map is also really, um, I'll talk about it not at length, but <laughs> do so much more with it. I'd like to compare it with what the other maps of Harbin at the time were. I think uh, one of the graduate students asked a really interesting question about how the disease maps relate to um, cartography at the same time. And I think I could do something more with this. Because this is very much a map um, made for the um, by the Russians for a Russian audience, um, indicating all the infrastructure that they had put in place to control the pneumonic um, uh, epidemic at the time. Um, and in reading Wu Yang Du's uh, work in um, relationship to this, they, they cooperated quite uh, closely. Um, and I would like to um, kind of see how this differs from what was available um, in terms of predicting how at the time. My suspicion is it's 
different sort of thing. That it's really very much about all the different houses, whether it's like currencies and, and the port the Portland Sanitaires that were set up and the different institutions that were set up at that point. But again, this is definitely a work in progress. I presented you with a very open kind of I had no idea I'd be thinking about writing a book about this subject. Um, so English language sources um, for the same, this is um, for the 1910 flag epidemic. Um, again, very strong emphasis on vector and transmission along the railway tracks and then, of course, people going to their hometowns and, uh, afterwards, and this is a printed version of the same thing. And these are all published in international circulating works, um, intended for a different audience of physicians training Western medicine. And this was a famous conference held at Mukden at the end that was uh, organized by the Chinese and very much a political uh, um, not just repercussions, but intentions to, to really show that China had uh, control of their own borders. The maps are very interesting in that there's no transmission outside of China. They're, they contained it, and, and, and they organized the conference immediately because they know that there's Russian and Japanese you know, efforts to argue, argue that they should have control of the region. Or that they should have precedence over the scientific discoveries, etc. The main man responsible for controlling that plague epidemic that ended up killing about 60,000 people was William De. Um, Malayan born Chinese, um, more comfortable in English and French and German than in Mandarin Chinese, so he was Cantonese speaking. Um, but he, I think he had some basic literacy, but he had a secretary that wrote the Chinese, etc. He then um, sets up the Northern Manchuria Plague Prevention Service. Uh, I think at least a chapter on him um, and this uh, both the experience in, in um, controlling the venture and bubonic plague and then its reoccurrence in 1921 and um, you know basically terminating the end of the venture and plague prevention service in, in 1928 and also the the last um, poster I have I have 1921 and 1928 posters 28 posters on cholera is very interesting because he then ends up focusing on cholera when he runs the national quarantine service on Shanghai. Now, this map is very interesting to me because it's the first one um, I see, actually see Chinese characters and in English. Um, again, it's more, um, you don't have the house to house kind of control over the epidemic, but it's more about the general um, spread of it. And the same map you see behind here, oh, here. And this is another map, I think, of the, of the city of Harbin, which I wanted to get a copy of as well. And for me, what I need to unpack is what kind of you know, work did these maps do for him personally in his daily life? How did, how did they guide his decisions? So I need to read them more closely against the published works that he did from the period, and then voluminous. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic that I'll be able to do that. Um, and I think then you can really see how the practice relates to the map, not just abstract and my interpretation, but really connected to practices that, and, and specific actions that he took at the time. Um, just to He's a, this is a very interesting one because there, again, he's very much involved in the research on Sabbatic plague. And so you see here the mapping of reservoirs, plague centers, not the, an actual epidemic. So this is a really great example, I think, of the China as a field site for knowledge about these diseases that benefit from the part of um, modern medical knowledge. Um, here is a broader distribution of these reservoirs in, in global, not just in China. Now in the manual, um, that he published on Friday in 1936. He summarizes everything uh, exhaustively about his experience with play. And frankly, I was never interested in ever reading this book. Well, we end up, because my work has been dominantly China-centered and you know, classical Chinese and Ming Qing. Um, but this book is extremely interesting for me in this topic because he um, includes in the appendix cultures that, to my knowledge, are no longer extant. Um, and so, uh, I don't know how many of you were or um, how, you know, where they were distributed. But um, he, he presents a very interesting juxtaposition between um, this case, the Bonic Plague, but also the Bonic Plague and its distribution in the world, how uh, it came to China. And then the next register is the Petri dish. So one of the um, most influential works in my career has been Andy Cunningham's article on on uh, the transformation of plague through the petri dishes of the laboratory, how the meaning of plague is completely transformed from that point on and to a cause-based rather than symptom-based. 
And um, much of my book is actually based on that idea that it's very dangerous to do retrospective diagnosis. And I did a great deal of work to understand Chinese understandings of epidemic. And then I think of this, the laboratory is really an epistemological rupture. So it's very interesting to me to see how he connects those two registers, the, the largest scale and the, and, the, and the smallest scale, and shows that this is a causative agent. And now that we know what it is, you know, in every patient, you have to determine it's, you know, they don't have plague because of the glucose. They have plague when you when you run it through the tissues through the petri dish, and it, they, you can see the little mod like bacilli. Um, and then he says that in this case, he transmitted with fleas, right? Um, that's a transmission. These are, this is what the patients look like. Uh, this is um, how to prevent it, and, and this is uh, where you should go to get it treated. It, you know, uh, that it's just a close-up of it. And then, you know, very simple Chinese. I, I am sure he did not write this. He could not write Chinese. This is a very classical stuff, very lovely calligraphy. I'm sure he just said what needed to be written, and someone else did it. But he may have written out this. Um, the mnemonic light is slightly different because, of course, it can be transmitted, um, uh, you know, person-person pages, so you have someone coughing and transmitting it to someone else. A uh, very famous case where a French physician, Nephi, didn't believe that it was mnemonic light and actually died. So he didn't protect himself from the way to the Russian courts. Shortly after, he, conducted, he had a big feud with Wolverine about, you know, that he should be in control, not really end up. And he was pushing seniority, you know, he was not respecting his seniority. It was a very moving um, anecdote in his uh, And then finally, this um, cholera image here, um, again, um, using the petri dish, trying to show that you know, the cholera that sells here is a positive agent related to the maps of the world and when it came to China, and its major symptoms, um, where you go and how you treat it. Very didactic, not directed like you would expect in public health books that would be for this. Saying, you know, use a face mask, don't drink the water, that kind of thing. It's very um, scholarly almost, not like public health posters. And what's so interesting to me, and it's 1928, is that this is when the second edition of Diseases of China is, is um, published, and there, none of the maps appear, and there's even a statement that really um, geography is not as much a determinant to these diseases that we thought before, and there's you know, no reason to include the maps we've already published them. We have nothing more to say about it, and it's basically bringing the original facts up to date with uh, all the new findings of laboratory medicine. And so I think of it as um, we're looking at a major transition from medical geography to the rise of the history of the laboratory medicine. So that's the big trajectory of the paper, and I really look forward to your comments and much better. After I hear Professor Young's comments, should I think about it? Well, this is a very exciting, actually. You know, I want to I comment that the, uh, as, as uh, John introduced it, I study uh, uh, infectious disease for about the past 50 years, and uh, I use the mapping tool as Quantum's probably major tool in my study. And almost probably 80% of my publications, I use map. And but the map leading to this, I feel embarrassing. <laughs> Reason is that the uh, you know like some of the tools I've been using now compared to what happened a hundred years ago, it looks like they're more sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was it was kind of you know like a, some of those very detailed maps to show the disease cases. So that's why this is my first time actually to interact with medical geography where people study sort of the his historical perspective of the disease. So it'll be very interesting kind of, you know, because we have people study medical geography, history, and also we have a public health professional. It'll be interesting to see what they think, you know, what's kind of the interaction you know, from the different perspective and uh, to understand the disease. And I probably later on have some more specific question for, for you related to you know how from our historical perspective, what kind of message you can have for public health? You know, we've been dealing with this infect disease, not only you know in developing world, uh, the developing world, but also developed well as well. And we've been struggling for lots, lots of challenge. <coughs> and so it'll be interesting, you know, like they kind of you know, compare the challenge we have versus probably what you learned from the history. All we learned from you, you know, from, from that. 
So with that, I want to actually probably just open for questions first, and then probably uh, uh, some discussion. All right? Okay. So any questions for <coughs> first? Way to these. Uh, <coughs> And I actually do have some specific, one, one, way, you know, one question I have is that the, uh, um, by studying this, uh, you know, almost we had several hundred years ago, uh, the disease situation in China, um, compared to sort of what happened in the modern times, you know, like the, uh, the I, I study disease after probably just uh, uh, the infected disease in China, just probably between 20 years from now. So, I want, yeah, from 19, per, around 1985 after now, so 20 some 30 years. So, one of my question is that the, uh, it's interesting to see, you know, the health professional way back, you know, like that 80 years ago, mm -hmm. you use this kind of, people kind of tool. And I want to hear your comments. Um, what was the kind of difference between what they've been using? That thing versus what we're using now. I need to consult with you. Well, you know, I can share with you. I can <laughs> share with you what we. I can share with you what we being actually using now. But you know, I didn't know what happened back then. For, for, for example, plague outbreak. That was something you know, I heard about it. That was a big thing back to, you know, like almost 100 years ago. Excuse me. Uh, about 100 years ago, they mm -hmm. plague outbreak in yes. that region. In that region. The one in. Um, in Yunnan in 1878. Right. But and then again in Hong Kong and how does the mapping tool back then kind of help the company of the uh, I don't know whether they have any public health agency or you know any any kind of you know the uh, policy making process prevention control. How does that actually play a role? You know the mapping tool. Um like those are things that are um, absolutely part of the story of these maps. I can't say for 1878 so much because that seems to be no, not seems it was the um, it was the, the, the individual initiative of the Dr. Manson who was there at the time um, and he collected the materials from the sources in the United States. But the the later plague epidemic in Hong Kong is very clearly political. That they were really concerned, of course, about. Um, Commercial problems, but about trade not letting them come into the you know, not letting them come into the harbor. They had um, even British subjects who died from it. Uh, it wasn't just; it was dominantly in the Chinese community, um, but it was a, a major political loss of face to have this huge epidemic in Hong, in Hong Kong, really. Um, and uh, an ability to control it to show that they could stem its, you know, spread and, and not. Um, um, have it um, be worse, even worse, or spread beyond Hong Kong, like I think is you know, one of the things that they successfully did. And I think the maps are really interesting because they really actualize visually mm -hmm. their ability to track it in that colony. Um, and the maps, I think, therefore have a function that, that um, Tom's book doesn't talk about, which is in terms of legitimating that colonial power structure, that kind of technology of power where but what's interesting about that map, it's hybrid in that it's also, you'll notice, tracking rats. So it's also a thinking tool, which I argue the earlier maps are trying to work out causal relationships, not just legitimating current power relations. Um, and so that, that map I find I, I particularly interesting and need to unpack it more. It's helped, um, and, and linking it actually to the scholarship Susan Jones is doing on Sabbatic Plague. And uh, how important that China field site was for the development and understanding of that. And it's something that Mulinda definitely jumps on to in 1910. And uh, the plague maps you'll see also attract the crack of the series. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think, there, you know, it's political in a kind of colonial context, but there's also public health yeah. Um, yeah. You know, actions that are legitimated by them. And, and I can think, you know, guiding. You know, they use them. They, like, I just find that image of Julian Doe with the map of um, Fort Carbon and Manchuria behind them. Mm -hmm. You know, very um, 
um, suggestive of, of you know, he has them right at his shoulder, you know, using them, it's making decisions based on their spatial um, knowledge, maybe. Yeah. So that's the kind of work I'm trying to bring out more. If you didn't bring that up, I was going to ask you well, to say it up. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, really I, I, I know who nominated it, but I can't come up with it. Like this, but, uh, <laughs> but he was nominated several times. For that. He was nominated once? or uh, Once for the period for which the archives were open. I think because he died shortly before 1950, uh, probably one time. The Senate, of course, became a prominent member of the position. Um, can you uh, go for the research on the modern play, right? Uh, for the research you did on the modern play. Uh, yes. farther into the future of the lecture. Um, what I wonder is whether you have been able to, um, uh, or whether you have any interest uh, in, in going beyond these particular posters. Uh, in other words, have you looked at all at uh, medical, uh, public sanitation, public health kinds of posters uh, from this period outside of Umbianda's own production? Uh, there's not that many. Um, that are still extant, but uh, there are some extant um, in the National Library of Medicine. And um, the main point I made about how these are very unusual, really wonderful, is um, they're so didactic. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much information on them. Um, and all the other ones from the period are really um, declarative. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, not at all explanatory. They're, you know, well, I shouldn't say not at all. Um, this one, you said it's from 1910? Yeah, from 1910. I mean, this one, this one is basically showing the cycle of, um, so this is the kind of thing that was circulating in 1910. This is supposed to be 1921. Um, cycle of schistosomiasis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Break it down so the way. She's so um, so, so it's a, you know, and it has arrows showing how you get it from water, from the snails, and, you know, it's very, you know, there's, you don't have to read small print to get it, right? Whereas with um, William Dose, I don't think it's at all evident from the images that he presents what he's talking about. You have to read the accompanying passages, especially for the petri dishes. You know. Yeah. How widely does so I think that the big problem with that, I just wanted to finish, is that I, I um, actually came up with the, graduates, the discussion with the graduate students um, this afternoon, too, that it would be very productive to see what he's borrowing from. Yeah, um, and I don't know. I need more archival work. I need to look at more. I mean, the largest collection of public health posters from China are at the National Library. They 
total of fifteen hundred. It was a donation of a collector. Um, so that's collector I know best. Um, but I um, not that many I saved and collected in China, frankly. Um, but there are quite a few from um, the Republican period. They're not that many from the earlier, but some. Um, so this is uh, this is I mean doing comparative work with what other kind of iconography and images are available at the same time that people have seen. I think is a really productive way to go. One, you know, things that are very different from what he does, and maybe seeing something which uh, you know he's following from what his own kind of odd propaganda cultures in his own words. But maybe you have seen some things that you could. Well, uh, I, 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 have, too, I have another uh, uh, research project, not my own, um, with a graduate student at Princeton who's working on um, medical advertising uh, in, the, in the 1920s and the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I spoke to this person in Nanjing about uh, three or four years ago, uh, he was focusing solely on newspapers. And the whole time I've been wondering whether there wasn't something beyond newspapers. Oh, absolutely, yeah. because actually the, we well, know this because they're preserved in the National Library of Medicine Collection. I have a graduate student working on them. The Tuberculosis Society, Shanghai Association for the Tuberculosis, did publish a lot of odd sites about how tuberculosis was spread. It's the major, I would say the most important um, initiative um, in the 1920s and 30s in Shanghai to try to control the tuberculosis. So there's quite a, a nice um, collection of these books. Let me ask just one other uh, question and then I'll hand out to somebody else. Uh, I looked back through your footnotes. I, uh, I couldn't quite figure out where Julian um, Bill's book was published or where these posters were made. And uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I, I noticed, for instance, the, the play conference. For most of the books he's publishing himself. I call the Manchuria and um, the Northern Manchurian play prevention bureau material is self published. Um, the flag manual as well comes, as you know, he's, he's his own clearinghouse really, he's got all the resources available to him. But his own, the um, autobiography is actually published um, in Philadelphia. He oh. was um, publisher, I think it was an English edition of the printing, the first printing house. Um, but the other ones are all published in publishing houses, I mean publishing houses, by his own organization. The National Quarantine Service is a major publisher of proceedings. Because yeah, I noticed the, um, the play conference at Monk Bend in 1911, that was published in Manila. Oh, yeah, right. You know, that's, you know, there's lots of, you know, that's, so uh, tell me why, you, well, of course you're interested in the publishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the same kinds of reasons uh, networking, cycling, yeah, right. distribution. Uh, and so forth. Ah, here, see, this is um, right. This this manual is his own National Quarantine Service, the Wei Shum Shum. Um, and that's that's the one that published, uh, I mean, printed, he doesn't even count, he just, fortunately for me, he left them in the appendix. He printed, he printed them in this um, manual. What else? Um, these are, yeah, so, um, oh, you're saying this conference proceedings, yes. This one is the one you're talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Strong is the editor. This, this aren't his own map. He's not what he does, actually. Mm -hmm. um, he's the editor that printed this one. And um, this was actually proceedings of the Royal Society of uh, Medicine. I mean, that the whole medical community was um, interested in this. But these aren't actually really and does. These are English. This is a section of English language sources. The ones that are really and does are just publishing it. So, so, so this is interesting because and then I could, I mean this, this of course brings me into the whole networks of, you know, top of medicine. Mouldy and Dill is then, of course, publishing for later. Okay. Um, I had a question kind of on this uh, administrative aspect, uh, especially kind of Chinese administrative practices. Oh, I'm Austin. I'm a graduate student. Um, what was, or what were the consequences, if any, kind of during the Ming period for an official, uh, if 
uh, plague or disease was it in his province. Was it something that's kind of marked on his report card as he goes and transfers in Beijing? Is that marked on his record? No. I imagine it isn't, and then I want to ask. Rebellions, yes. Right. And is, it, is that something that changes over time, that in a sense, is as you move from um, kind of this, uh, this new understanding of disease, and you can map it, you can control it, you can contain it, is this kind of a new, uh, do we see kind of fault in the bureaucracy as far well, as? I think that the best book on the subject, actually, uh, that maps out that transition to when the state takes serious control or concern over the health of its people is um, Ruth Lodowski's book right. on hygienic modernity. Mm -hmm. And I like to think, I don't like to think, I intentionally edited my book, basically, where her book takes off in the 1870s. Right. And I think she really makes a strongest argument about how, um, you know, this trend, how the, through the term Wei Sheng, um, mm -hmm. came to mean something very different from the original meaning, meaning to more individual responsibility mm -hmm. of your health to a state responsibility, and then the concomitant uh, controls over individuals that haven't been there before, where they can defecate, where they can, you know, all that kind of thing that, that she, I think, details really mm -hmm. exquisitely well mm -hmm. in hygienic community. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's, that's the mm -hmm. angle that goes through that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I maybe, and of course the maps are, are legitimating quarantines and other kinds of um, practices that were part of the Chinese state before. They did quarantine people, but it's got a, a very dear friend of mine, Dagmar Schaffer, she's the whole reason I'm in Germany in the first place, because I butchered her name at an international conference, and I told her if she wanted to remedy the situation, she could bring me to Germany, and I would be happy to learn her language, because I hadn't had a stitch of German. So this is how I got to Germany for the year. Mm -hmm. I've come since 2008. As soon as I sent my book off, I emailed and I said, so are you ready to pay up on your side of the deal? <laughs> <laughs> and anyways, the reason why I brought her up is because she has a wonderful paper on the Song, Southern Song um, major official that we all know of uh, Chinese history, or intellectual history, um, who, who were really obsessed about husbandry. Mm -hmm. And they practiced quarantine on their animals. And especially in the southern song, they had very limited livestock and horses. And, um, and very, it was really problematic on how to keep them alive. And they understood very well that the horses were, that disease was contagious amongst the livestock. And they, they, practiced, they, they practiced very systematic quarantine to preserve their livestock. And there's a wonderful paper that will be being published soon. Um, but quarantine was very new. I mean, this is, this is the major, um, people have written about this in the 1894 in Hong Kong. That was the major conflict that the British had with the local Chinese traditions and institutions. And Bill Benedict has written at length on this in the book in 1975. Mm -hmm.
We should go and, go and book together as well. <laughs> you can do the Taiwan one. So I'll do that. Yeah, that's so interesting. And then you were talking to me earlier about how these um, Japanese maps of disease in Taiwan were yeah. about to legitimate well, the this map was not Taiwan. On, this, this map was not, not, was not only important to uh, investigate or, or, or infectious diseases in, China, in Taiwan, but also important, especially in the cases of it's also important for the tour guide to mm -hmm. try to fight back yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, so tell me a bit more about that. Well, the, well, uh, the, the, well the, the tour guide was invited by the government to do an investigation. But when they can, can when they arrive to Taiwan, they already know that the victory is because of a big in Hong Kong. So they just want to use Taiwan to prove what they want. And they use a different, different method to uh, examine the disease in Taiwan. So they want to and they use a different, different method to uh, examine the, uh, the bacteria. And they even bring one specimen back to Japan. And spread it out, we can extend it, try to, try to examine other cases they collect, especially around the turn of the country. There's a contact right there. So in, roughly in 1900 to 1901, the Kinasado has, has to steal his mouth up and admit he was born in Hong Kong. However, in 1911, that was still with a German state mm -hmm. to Manchuria. And that's a very weird Very state. interesting story. I mean, that's pretty And then, of course, what's so interesting you know, about the maps are the people behind them. Both, not just the people producing them, but the people that, that, you know, that are suffering from them. laboratory medicine, not just the rise, but the actual efficacy, the, the repeatability, the other thing I know about in the history of like science studies, that this is, this is uh, replicated in labs, the labs, they're, they're very, diseases of China, that book is all about teaching people how to use the labs and the PP dishes, etc. and it, it's a that rather successful transformation um, uh, of the passage of the plague through the petri dish, you know, and, the, and that um, I'm still working with 20 years later, and I'm just an article. And so the maps take on new functions. But there's what's so interesting in the 1894 maps, and I, and I think it's on, especially the ones that are dealing with syllabic plague in um, 1910, there's still some relationships that are not quite sure, like how, you know, in 1894, they don't know if the central world is free yet. Um, so they, they know that rats are involved. They don't yet know exactly the transmission. So that think the maps are functioning as well as thinking tools there. But then um, when you have the, uh, yeah, right. So I think that there, it's an interesting, useful distinction to make. And then there's the like, symbolic maps that you come later, where you have the personification of, you know, Russia as an octopus, you know, and China as this like hopeless, you know, sick man of no, I don't think it's Chinese at all, actually. This happens on, it happens to be in China. These major transformations are European, on Chinese soil. I never imagined I would be looking at them or studying them. It's, it's not, but I think because of um, coming out of a really, you know, very productive intellectual environment at Hopkins, um, that this, this paper actually comes directly out of conversations with my now deceased colleague, Harry Marks, 
um, he pointed me in the direction of reading about history of biostatistics and map making and all that, um, and completing my book. And I just found, you know, just what happened in China is very important for what happens in terms of knowledge about these diseases in Europe. I think that's there's an interesting synergy there. And I think that, you know, the maps are an interesting way to look at the people who are producing them and, and in their engagement with Chinese society and looking at these major transformations that Liz Podolsky talks about um, with the transformation of Beishan, but in a, very, in a very different way. They're complementary. So, I think we have a question at the back first. This is sort of, uh, you, you ground the, the region, uh, I'm going to mess this up, Wuling does, Nash is so unique in sort of his frustration with getting the people to do what he wanted them to do. Do you have any sense of why this is unique? I mean, if his maps are unique, why this problem is unique to his particular situation? I mean, why he needs to make a didactic um, poster as opposed to a kind of put on the map kind of instructive poster? Sort of dynamics in his particular situation, like what why it is unique. What is your name? Um, Mark, great. You were at the... Yeah. Um, he, and the other work that I started in the paper, but I, I really need to do more, is connecting the prolific text that Julian Dill has left with us with these maps. Okay, it's like situating him in his office and seeing how exactly he's doing those maps is one thing. And these, these posters he doesn't, I mean, I haven't read in his hospital. For the years in the 1921, we produced them. He doesn't specifically talk about the posters. But he does talk about how frustrating it is that the, that the people are continuing to resist their, I mean, they, he sees them as making the situation worse for the whole, he's looking at the whole. And they're thinking of their, their you know, the incursions on their individual, you know, individual um, freedoms, one, and also, um, you know, it's, it's, it's they're terrible for their loved ones to be taken away and cremated, and you know that nobody returns from the hospitals, and you can see why they're resisting and not wanting to talk about them. I think he under he certainly he he understands why um, the draconian policies to try to control the epidemic are being resisted. So he's trying to use a very rational approach, like maybe if they understand what I understand about how these diseases are caused and how they aren't, you know. By those so sort they're of not part of the change in the weather, or um, you shouldn't just. That, that, that he also talks about them being fatalistic and just resigning themselves to fate, and when he feels that you know actually there's something we can do about it, and I you know so I think that's reading the text, the maps in the light of his his uh, discussion about how um, he can understand them, but he also wants to you know, have them understand why he's carrying out the policies. Out for the better good of the whole society, right? Of course, I don't have anybody responding to his posters either. So it's always the problem. Reception. Well, that's what I was wondering about. Was, was this, I'm telling you, we have 1910 on Thornton. What's your term for this? Shit, I don't know. Versus the 1920. This isn't really the point. This is didactic, actually. Because it's, it's, it's saying, it's really explaining the, uh, it's, it's explaining the transmission of schistosomiasis from snails in the water. And, you know, it's more of it's, That has a lot of text on it. So it has a lot of text on it. It's not really so children. Um, but I wonder about class targeting. Are these posters, uh, I think who are these posters right. aimed at? Who are, I mean, are they, and is he leaving out the posters that you, it, it might be left out of these appendix unless you don't have them now. Um, the, the more, the more um, desired posters. Um, it might have been a Well, that's what's back to Chris's question. Yeah. I don't know if he, well, that's why I was kind of asking him. Is he possibly aiming at food makers in the neighborhoods who are more literate? Um, and saying, look, this is this is the wider context, and you use the knowledge of the people in the neighborhood. Question because he does talk about native practitioners a lot. Um, and, and if only they understood what he understands about the, the nature of the diseases, then they would join forces with them and they would, you know, protect themselves. And, I mean, there's a wonderful discussion about two Yao and Shun who are um, don't protect themselves, 
at all. And they, they're, they're managing an example of uh, natural immunity. You know, they didn't die. And you know, so many patients. And, and, you know, never once put a face mask on. Or they wore it on their neck, you know. So but, but Mark, I mean, I mean, you're right, of course. But it reminds you of the story of Mark von Kettenkopf and wanting to show that the germ disease here is wrong by swallowing a whole uh, yeah. other, uh, you know, <laughs> colony of a common man. Why is he I don't think it's a good one. Didn't they switch the feces? I mean, it was the hot feces. One of the feces about the feces was that they were switched. Yeah, probably. Uh, but, I mean, there's also a case of Ms. Leo, who, trans, who was a carrier, and he also talks about, I mean, it's so interesting that in his discussion, there's all these variations. He has these case studies that end the, old, the first chapter of his biography. And she, you know, she killed everybody she took care of. Yeah, it's Typhoid Mary, Typhoid Leo. And she tried to flee, um, and they caught her. This is this is more of an observation than a question. Um, it might be not qualified as an observation. We'll see. Um, but one of the things that I was noticing looking at the maps as they simple as they progressed in time is something that I've been thinking about um, as a Europeanist in the European context, which is the role that infrastructure and technology is playing in disease in, mm -hmm. in creating a kind of artificialized ecology through which disease uh, spreads. Um, you know, generated, and it seems that by by the time we're getting to these later slides, the geography as such is receding mm -hmm. and being replaced by infrastructure in the centre of having train lines, oh, maps yes, of houses. Yes, right. um, you, your everything is becoming much more geometrical mm -hmm. uh, as coastlines and rivers are receding, um, mm -hmm. and human-built technologies and technologies, the apparatus of development. Um, is the object of focus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by the end, you visualize the infrastructure of disease rather than the geography. Um, and this is something that is palpably obvious in, in Europe at the same time. You can see it in, in much of the historiography of uh, European disease. Um, what should I read on that? It emerged, it, 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 mm -hmm. it's never ever made explicit in anything I've read, but implicitly it's clearly there in David Barnes's work on the great city of Paris. Um, which I read in graduate class recently. And one of the things that came out of this book was that the various public health officials in, in France at the time were envisaging disease as being something uh, which was caused by faulty cesspools. It's yes, the foul on the fiber. Right, yeah, all, of that, all of that stuff. Yeah. It, it's no longer, uh, with, with the decline of the asthmatism, or whatever you want to call it, uh, if it ever was a paradigm, with the decline of that, um, We'll get some new focus on kind of human built structures as both causes and the central remedies uh, for disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really something that, that seems to be happening in the US. And that might suggest why the job of the comes to an end. Because you don't need a new coastline of care for That's a really interesting insight. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, maps do continue, obviously. Mm -hmm. You're still doing maps. What they're actualizing is this, this human infrastructure. Really. Um, I would say absolutely for the later maps that us that we had to publish in Shanghai, mm -hmm. we have um, and we have so what wonderful is the map of um, Fongfo River, and basically what he's what he's mapping is all the uh, ways um, that the uh, the all the institutions along the, right. the river and, the, and where the quarantine service is. Because what it's depicting is the controls we have when the next epidemic comes through. Mm -hmm. and there's no epidemic in that map, but it's all about what we've got set up right. when it does come through again. You know, so That's a really great distinction I, I, I think will be in my next iteration. <laughs>
Yeah. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not at all, I guess, uh, uh, Tim Buckley, I'm not a, at all a historian, but I'm, I'm interested in public health. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I know within, you know, the times that I've studied public health, um, there's tension between uh, public health and the economy. And I, I can I can imagine that that was playing out as well, right? Because a quarantine is going to devastate your uh, economy. So, so you had a, a physician, right, who uh, was broadcasting, you know, epidemic and, and how to manage it, including these quarantines. I'm just wondering if that that same kind of tension existed, where um, you know, pol I guess politicians had to manage the economic interests against the public health interests. Do you see that manifested in, it, in, in your, your examination of history? A absolutely. I, I, I probably didn't bring that out um, um, explicitly as a, certainly in the next generation who will be brought up, but public health is always um, uh, a matter of not just the social good, but um, an economic interest are always at play. Because when, when you have an epidemic coming through, it's it's going to affect the commercial trade about this, right? People aren't going to come into the ports. So. so who wins? Who, who won back in, in that time? The, the, the economics or the public health? Um, so I, well, within, yeah. my, within my history, yeah, it's, it's, because it's, the economy yeah. always wins it, in recent times, I think. Public health always loses. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the, the economic interests prevail, um, and, and so I'm just wondering how that played out at that time. Well, that's how I have to think of the, I have to think of that question in, in each specific epidemic, um, which is more helpful to think about it and as a sub storyline. I could play quickly in some public health of the economy because if the public health wins, it's better for the economy. Well, I think so. I mean, in the, certainly in the long run. Yeah, but so you're saying in situations with economic interests um, overgrow the um, public health, or the ideal public health practice. Exactly, exactly. You know, do we, do we suppress trade, or do we sacrifice, you know, X number of lives? Or another way of looking at this.
uh, for issue with the quarantine services. But the old time, or the old Chinese time, was sophisticated because of the quarantine system. So it depends on what you are looking at. I just want to probably follow up the uh, TMC question here. I want to use this more of an example from China back in 2003, the SARS outbreak. I think it, after the outbreak, the Chinese government did admit that the, the tremendous economic loss due to that outbreak is associated with kind of slow public health action. So if they actually take public health earlier because of the transparency issue, so if that kind of feel like a tech, Disclose the situation earlier, take the public health action, the situation would be much more different. So that was probably some of those public health action that also kind of facilitated how you know community problem. Alright, so uh, we have questions. Yeah. Uh, Dr. The more I listen to this conversation, um, uh, the more skeptical I become of Juliando. <laughs> uh, and, and your presentation of them. Um, and, and partly it's the context. If there were many overseas Chinese uh, from Nanyang, Southeast Asia, uh, in this period, the late Qing and the early Republic, um, who encountered um, uh, Western science, Western law, um, various uh, administrative systems uh, in places like Penang, where he came from, Malacca, Singapore, and others. Uh, and many of these people um, uh, returned return to China um, always under the guise of performing philanthropic public service. Uh, a classic example is Tan Ka uh, the rubber king of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, who established Chaman University and various other institutions. Um, you know, I, I have to wonder if uh, Ulianda wasn't the same sort of person, but with a medical twist. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I was in graduate school and when I was an undergraduate, I knew many medical students who regularly shocked me with their uh, cynical approach to disease uh, and uh, disorder in the third world. They looked upon, um, uh, uh, they looked upon internships in Africa and South America and other places as a golden opportunity to study in an environment that the petri dish and the laboratory couldn't provide. And they jumped on these chances to go and study tropical ailments and so on and so forth. Now, you've told me that Uenda was a self-publisher. This fits perfectly, don't you agree? Uh, oh, if this self-publisher, he had, he had the administration, he had this Chinese state administrative apparatus backing him up. He wasn't coming from his private funds. Well, this is the other side of it. Um, uh, you didn't talk very much about Uyanda and, and how he came to China, but I wonder if he came here with a research project in mind for for which he to which he committed sounds like 18 years, 20 years, longer. Um, uh, it, um, perhaps with his own funds. But by 1920. Yeah. No, not his own He was a. He got three years before in the um, in Tianjin at the uh, Beiyang Medical College. Army surgeon. Army surgeon. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he, he's 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 not the first choice actually to run the um, to to go up and take charge of this um, this epidemic. Okay. And I'm sure he's, he, it happens to be that he knows who Alfred Zhe, I forgot his Chinese name. Oh. He's, he's then the, the, the counselor yeah, and then foreign and the diplomat, very famous. And they know each other through Chinese net, uh, oh. overseas networks because he went and yeah. got a master's in Cornell. Somehow they met through overseas okay. connections. Um, and there was another, um, actually, uh, um, American physician. Uh, some other physician was trained um, in the States who somebody else wanted instead of William Zill, but Zill actually overrode that decision and had him go. And he very clearly, I think, and I said that in the paper, I think he went with the idea that he could think of this question. I mean, 
I certainly think that's the case. But it's something, it's like something that fell in his lap rather than something that, that put him in China in the first place. Uh, I don't know Melinda's early history, about how he got back into the um, Harvard Baptist Convention, because he's the first Chinese um, who graduated from Cambridge Medical School. Well, he certainly conceded in the first place. Thank you. 
um, one in which these are entities that, that are, are ahistorical, or transhistorical. Um, and to me, that's a, a more um, complex and interesting way to look at the past um, at this point. Um, I'm not, I think it's, I like the way Angela Liang dealt with the issue in the book on leprosy, in which she, um, she she's not as um, maybe forceful about the position uh, the, the, the debate in the way I am. <laughs> Um, I, I tend to like, take a side and see what people have to say about it afterwards. Um, but she, the way she deals with that issue of retrospective diagnosis is, is, is to look at the symptoms and, and also look at the complexity of and the range of terms and, um, that the Chinese use in understanding what we now would be considered to be modern day leprosy. And leprosy is very interesting because it's actually a disease concept that has not successfully gone through the Koshkoptolists. It, it, it's not actually it hasn't finished the fourth one, and they are yeah, not able to reproduce it or have it. You know, um, so that's a that's a, there's an interesting ambiguity in that. Um, that particular so that's that's my position, and I, I make that point very strong in this paper, um, but also certainly in the conclusion of my book because I think I think there's a there is a epistemological rupture that happens, and that that um, in the 1910 Diseases of China book, which is the title of this talk. Um, all of that matter is, you know, the whole different ballgame. And, and that retrospective diagnosis starts and they, they will be checked it under China's past, etc. So, um, but I, don't, I think that looking at prehistoric bones and finding, you know, the being able to figure out that the person had the tuberculosis bacilli in them mm -hmm. is interesting of itself, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, so. You know, from for my perspective as a health professional, uh, if, if I use this China example, and back to you know, the disease situation back then and now, I kind of have a mix of feeling both that I'm happy with kind of the reduction of disease burden, the situation, mm -hmm. and I'm also aware from the sum of the things. Let me just, you know, use this as my sister disease I've been working on as an example. Uh, back to, you know, like the 1920s, 1910s, you know, this disease actually killed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, in 1960s or 1950s, you know, Chairman Mao wrote a poem about the uh, fair work, the plague, because, you know, there's one kind, actually, the claim that the inimulate the, the diseases, you know, schismosis. Right. And if I've been working on schismosis, you know, if you look at the disease burden over the pack, Past the 30 years, is actually really reduced a lot. And uh, if we use this, uh, you know, the example of clutter, for like example, also reduce a lot. But what I'm worried is that the if the play, the clutter, still epidemic, still taking places in China, sporadically at different places. What I'm worrying about is that if you look at the China's, you know, overall economic developer, for example, and the government. Claim that they invest tremendously in sanitation, health facility. So, as a public health professional, that worries me because there's something wrong. We don't really actually do something to work well. And given these such investment, there's still lots of the disease that going. And then, you know, I also start working in Africa. If the Africa, the country, you know, where they, they need the sanitation as a facility, reach this at this point, what China has. I don't know how long that would take. And even to reach that point, you still probably have lots of those disease burden, you know? So this is something that worries me. I don't know how to answer, you know, my own question. I just feel like that was something, uh, probably, you know, that's why we need to kind of interdisciplinary really come to study this. There's something just, you know, it's not right. See, what I, what I find so interesting is what's very useful about agreeing upon a Western kind of classification. Mm -hmm. Is that um, it? It legitimate. It, it allows consensus and, and agreement and, and action that can be taken for the betterment of, 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 of a society. We just need these these work. It's the kind of work that you do. Mm -hmm. But then the problem is that the only classification that's taken is that other options for therapy are completely de 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 delegitimated. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, in the SARS case, um, I found it um, really problematic that the, the fact that some over fifty percent of patients in China were treated with both um, these Wenbing treatments, integrated medicine, herbal formulas, and the you know 
um, antiviral steroids and oxygen and other kinds of things, um, was completely neglected in the Western press because the, the way of thinking, the Chinese traditional nosology of understanding how those therapies work was, was considered not legitimate, but it's symptom-based and it's individual-based. And the way they thought about the causation was not cause-based. I mean, in one specific cause-based. And so it, um, I think then what happens if you only take one nosology, the, the modern you know, nosology that is the central part of evidence-based medicine, um, then, then the other possibilities for treatment are um, that may be effective in fact in integrative medicine. I mean, it's, um, essential part to be bilingual and bicultural and understand multiple ways of uh, framing uh, symptoms. Um, then you have the problem of, you know, other therapeutic possibilities being um, not just uh, ignored, but just, you know, dismissed. That is, that is the main problem I have with that. I mean, I think it's so interesting, the epistemological rupture is, is, is historical, it's interesting to say the disease maps you see, there's an incredible force with them. I think of Latour's book on the pasteurization of France, of, of, of really um, transforming the public health of the society and improving the quality of life overall. Of course, with the McEwen thesis, it's you know better housing, better water, <laughs> other much broader social things that, that help um, improve the longevity of the human population in developed countries at least. Um, but there's this other aspect that I find that's problematic. There's just a quick observation, last observation. Um, <laughs> the fact that there's a different paradigm that's coming into play in the categorization and the shift to the domestic categorization may, may hide something else. In, 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 a colleague in um, 19th century Japanese history makes the argument in regard to causation of earthquakes that the pattern of beginning to look for and think about universal causes and think about it as a pattern in and of itself. You mean it, that very no. Oh. No, this is Greg Smith, who's, oh. who's doing work like this at the uh, uh, um, uh, he is He's arguing in a, a, a manuscript in, it's in a collection of Japanese and Americans that in fact, uh, this lays the groundwork for the very work that Japanese science models do. People who get used to being thinking about the international causes of things. And, and although it's, it's different, you do have a long tradition in, in the Chinese context that kind of thinks systematically based on certain kinds of principles, and that may, um, in a different realm from deciding the classification system, it may still be making some kind of contribution to uh, adaptability and willingness to think in these, in these terms of the Western medicine. It's just, it's somewhat off the question of the classification system can be used, but, 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 but you're still thinking about a shift in, like, Yeah, I think that's a new kind of terminology, and I'd like to actually take action as a collective, I just, that I think is um, really clear in my case in this case, too. Um, and it's, it does have greater power than the traditional system they have different yeah. ends. I mean, you can't, you know, it means an end. Okay, I want to just quickly um, mention that uh, in two weeks, Michael, we'll be presenting a, a continuation of our examination of, of uh, uh, disease yeah, in China. Yeah, I'm trying to be here. Uh, but in the meantime, those are going to be on the far ahead.